Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equate Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Today, Steve Farber returns, along with fellow researchers John Lennox and Ralph Pacheco, to further explore the mystery of the Standing Stone on the McCartney Farm in Scotland and whether the stone marks the burial site of biological Paul, who passed away back in 1966. And so without further ado, here's Steve, John, and Ralph. Welcome, friends. We have a fascinating show today. Steve Farber is back to take us through more of his research into where biological Paul might be buried. And joining Steve are two of his team members, Ralph Pacheco and John Lennox. John and his wife actually visited Billy's farm as part of the research into the mystery of the Standing Stone. And so with that, let's move to the first slide and talk about Scotland's right to roam law. And so, Steve, if you can take a moment and take us through that law, it would be appreciated. So the Scotland's uh, right to roam law, I found that out from another Scottish man over there, um, that you can go on somebody's property. But John Lennox probably has a little more on that because he, he actually lives over there in Scotland. So I'm probably just going to let him speak about his trip over there. It, it was kind of my idea to have somebody go over there, and him and his wife were perfect for it. I thought they had a lot of courage to go up there the way they did, and they did a good job filming and taking pictures and uh, even interviewed some people, which is great. Yeah, so John, why don't you take us through that? Just tell us a little bit about getting there and what your experience was like, and I would like to talk a little bit about some conversations you tried to have with some of the local folk to see if they would talk about it. And uh, tell us about the, the, the freedom to roam and um, your your trek over to the farm. The trek to the farm, it's very remote. It's very hard to get to. There's no road in here. It's closed off to the public. So you would to park probably a couple of miles away and walk across fields. And it was very remote. And we tried knocking on the door to ask permission to, to take pictures and he shot a couple of videos, but nobody, there was nobody at the property, although it was lived in and looked after quite well. That was about, I really spent a few hours with getting there and getting back to the, the vehicle in Campbelltown. And then we went into Campbelltown and we asked a couple of ladies in a shop about the standing stone and they just clammed up on us as if they weren't even really wanting to speak about it. Okay, so getting there was not easy. And is that because of where it's located, the size of the property, or the farm being fenced off, or all of the above? Uh, there, there was a road in it, but there was two farms on the road, and the gates were all closed and blocked off, so there was no like, straight route to drive into it. So what we had to do was we drove round about Campbelltown, and in the back entrance, there was kind of like a back way. We got at Google Maps, and there was a, a lock, so we found the lock, and then we seen a high park farm across the fields, and basically just parked as close as we could get to it and then just got and walked up and down hills. We were walking for quite a good while before we managed to get to it. Now, the farm is large. If I remember correctly from the first show, it's something like 183 acres. Is that right? That's about right. I've apparently owns the, both of those farms on the road up as well. He bought them as well to the their sightseers. But they, those were working farms, so I don't know if he's maybe got tenant farmers or what in there. Okay, so you basically had a park outside the farm, outside the gate, if I'm hearing you correctly, and then you had to walk. Yes, sort of flip fields. Okay, and so you did knock on the door. Yes. And uh, there was no answer. There was no answer, no. And were you able to see inside the house at all or anything like that? We could see that one of the windows was open, uh, and you could see, see, I've seen pictures before him, and that we used to turn that, and you could see like, the wood cladded ceiling, you could see that through the, the roof light when we when we walked out across to the stone. But really, that was it. We wanted to really pry too closely in case somebody was watching us. Okay, so you didn't you didn't encounter any type of security or anybody stopping you and questioning you why you were on the property? No, there was no one there at all. Okay, okay. So, and then you spoke to um, some folks in town, and when you asked about the farm, you said they clammed up. So what question did you ask them? It was my wife, and it was, they were all right with the farm. They said we were up to the sightseeing to see the farm. And they said, oh, that's nice. And then she mentioned the standing stone, and they just, doof. she says they both looked at each other and went quiet. Okay, so as soon as you mentioned a standing stone, the conversation just kind of went dark. They didn't want to talk about it. Yes, I, yep. Sorry, it was, it was really interesting that the way they clammed up, yes. 
Okay, very interesting. Now, I do want to say before we go any further, and I think the team here is going to uh, is going to agree, we are not advocating that folks make a pilgrimage to Billy's Farm. No. Certainly, if you go there, we are not condoning any type of behavior which would be disruptive to anything on the farm, which includes the standing stone, the farmhouse itself, or anything else that's there. So we want to make that very, very clear. And I suspect that after this show is aired, that there might be uh, a little more due diligence put in place by Billy or whoever is managing or living at the farmhouse to ensure that strangers are kept out and away. I mean, that's just a guess on my part. Based upon what you guys are saying with regard to the freedom to roam law in Scotland, there was no law broken. No. This was done for research purposes, even though Billy may not appreciate that <laughs> explanation. But uh, be it as it may, that's what you guys undertook. And we've got some very, very good information out of your trip to the farm, John. So, okay, now, when you got to the farm, and I guess what we'll do is we can move to slide number two, there's a red door. That's right. So, Steve, uh, you supplied me with information about what a red door means, and Billy's door, or the farmhouse door, is painted red, along with the gate going into the to the property, which leads to the walkway to the door. So, what does red mean? It means actually welcoming over in America. Um, what it would mean in Scotland, I'm not 100%. It also says protection, so I, I kind of hit on that word. I think it's at the very end of your slide there. It, it's a protection thing, so I believe they're protecting the body up there. You know, that's just me, how I feel, you know, and it's conjecture again, like always. Uh, a few things that John might have left out that I wanted to mention is it used to have a red roof. If you look at old slides of it, it had a red roof, so that's no longer there. And John was actually trying to find the red roof in the distance as some kind of landmark and he had trouble finding it because there was no red roof. So they replaced it with the red door, the red gates, and it's all well-maintained, freshly painted. Another thing I, I think John might have left out when he was actually up at the stone, there's a little bit of a video he shot, too. He actually, him and his wife, heard crackling in the woods as if something was walking through the woods, either a person, an animal, whatever it was. But he felt like he was being watched, I believe, John, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, it did feel as if a bit creepy, almost. There was definitely cracking and there was something in the woods, whether it was an animal or what, I don't know, but it definitely felt as if there was something there. Okay. All right. So possibly an animal, possibly somebody who was watching to make sure that you weren't doing anything disruptive. Uh, I might be watching for a distance. I don't know, but they didn't answer the door anymore. But if they were, they were outside. Okay. So let's move to the next slide where we have Billy standing in front of the stone with the horse. And then the middle picture is John in front of the stone. And then we have the picture of the stone where we are stepping back from it. So, John, tell us about the stone, the size of it. How tall are you? I'm 5 foot 11. I'm just a fraction under 6 foot. So it's 9 foot 6. That probably be about accurate, I think, by looking at it. Um, it's 9 foot uh, 6 inches, I believe. Yeah, it's 9 foot and I believe 6 inches tall. And the width... I had, I had the diameter, but I don't have it on me. But you can ah. see it's got a lot of girth to it. And so that, yeah. the size it's on one of the pages, the right size, and it does say 9 foot 6. Okay, there's the 96, which is 15, which is 6. And, of course, we also have, you know, the inverted 9s and 6s. So it could be 9 feet 6 inches, could be 99. It could also be 66. So, okay, so the numerology and the occultism is, is all around this, which is what we would have expected anyway. Now, John, is the stone itself, is it on a hill, or how is it positioned on the farm? It is on a slight, slight hill to the, towards the front of the farm. As, as you go beyond the stone, maybe 100 metres, 200 metres, there's a bigger hill towards the front of the property. But it's not, I wouldn't say it's not a great, a great big hill, just a small incline. Okay, so it's not on a hill, but there is an incline. All right, so let's move to slide number five, where we have two more pictures. On the left, we have a picture of the standing stone, and we're looking at it from the side, so we can actually see 
how deep it is. And it's got some stones around the bottom, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. And then to the right, we have the stone, and we can see the farmhouse. Okay, and as you said, uh, John and, and uh, Steve, at one point, that roof was red. Yeah. In the first show that uh, Steve, you took us through, I had received a comment where somebody said that the farm wasn't real. <laughs> I read that. Yep. Okay. I read that. It's, so yes. I think we could put that to rest. The farm is indeed real. Yeah. And uh but it no longer has the red roof. All right. So uh if we go to the next slide on slide number six, we have these uh the standing stone and there's three small stones at the base. But there were more than just those three stones. That's correct. Okay, so why did you focus on these three? I just had another theory, and again, it could be wrong, but there, there's other stones like around the other side. I didn't get an exact count how many because it's hard to actually count around the circle of it, circumference. Um, but I did see a grouping that looked like three, you know, on the picture there. Yeah. And something in my mind just went off that, you know, what if it was the three Beatles up there? And, you know, to pay respects, they they put the three stones there separately, you know, said a little blessing or a prayer or whatever they did at a ritual like that and put them there. Because a long time ago, 1977, there was a movie, Jesus of Nazareth. And I remember watching that, John the Baptist, when he, they buried him, they put these stones on top of his grave. You know, and I, I think it was to keep the soul down, they said. It was to keep the actual spirit from rising up from there, which is, you know, I might be wrong on that exact interpretation, but from what I remember reading. And then, you know, maybe the other side was Billy leaving a stone or somebody else, Jane Asher, whoever else was there, you know. So I thought maybe these stones were left as some kind of homage to him, you know. Again, you know, this is all theory, folks. And Yes, uh... exactly. Right. So keep that in mind as we go through this. But as I've mentioned to Steve in a couple of email exchanges, this is the closest, in my opinion, that anybody's ever gotten to where biological Paul is buried. So let's move to um, the next slide. That's slide number seven. And Steve, you had mentioned the three stones and possibly the three beetles. And, you know, as I was putting the, the slides together to help you guys out, what came to mind was the back of the Abbey Road album. And uh, and this is a well-known clue for those who are into the uh, Paul is Dead theory. And on the back of the Abbey Road album, we have these dots. And if you trace them, you have the number three. So three Beatles, Abbey Road. You know, I thought, Steve, that your theory uh, could possibly have some merit because it's not the first time we would have seen the number three associated with the whole Paul is dead McCartney conspiracy or Beatles conspiracy. Yeah, it is, as if one of them's missing, you know. To me, like I said, I, I almost got a visual in my mind, and that's, that's how I started with this whole thing, you know, the first video. It, it's almost like visions I'm getting. You know, you said you had things happen in your dreams. I'm almost getting visions of seeing three Beatles putting stones up by that. That's the big stone, you know, the standing stone. And, uh, it's very clear, you know, in my mind. People think I'm crazy thinking that, but that's just how I feel. Yeah, well, they can think we're crazy. You know, there's a lot of people think we're crazy just for believing that Paul McCartney was replaced. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we could just start with that. But it's okay. You know, we know what the truth is. And this is what I tell people all the time when folks write me and they say, uh, you know, Mike, my, my family thinks I'm crazy. My friends think I'm crazy. And I explain to them, look, the only thing that matters is that you know, right? Because everybody is, is at a different level with regard to understanding what this conspiracy is about. Some people don't believe it at all. Others have varying degrees of what they're willing to accept within the Paul is Dead McCartney conspiracy. And of course, we have uh, everything in between. So it's about what we're focused on and it's about what we know. All right, so let's move to the uh, the next slide, slide number eight. And this is the standing stone in relation to the, the left side of the barn. And I don't know, John, did you want to talk about this a little bit? That was that was the entrance. That was the way we come in. As you can see, that was it was a well-maintained little path. And from that path, it just leads into wild fields, basically. The farmers were working. 
it was all it was all well maintained. That that little burn is, is you probably can't see there, but we were standing at a gate, and that was the gate, which I think is the entrance to that property. And the standing stone was really the first thing we seen like, of the farm, even from a distance. It was the stone I noticed first because I was looking for the red roof, and it doesn't exist anymore, obviously. But that was about it, really. And uh, when you said that the farm is well maintained, and we could see that if we look to the picture on the right. We could see how the grass is is well maintained. It's cut, leading up to the farm. So it's obviously being cared for. That's right. So if we move to the um, to the next slide, slide number nine, maybe Steve, you want to talk about this a little bit. Uh, what were your thoughts about this? This burn, it actually means a stream. I don't know if that's a Scottish term because I never heard that over here. Maybe it is, John. Yes. Um, but I believe that's the area where they planted the tulips in that video because it's down a little bit to the left. And if you remember when you showed that Life magazine cover, it showed the stone up higher in the field. You know, I think it was over his shoulder. I believe that was the stone. I believe they were down near the stream. And, you know, somebody brought up the point. I'm not sure who it was. It might have been Ralph there. Where do I actually think there would be a body if there was a body? It could be. Under that burn area, you know, near that burn area where the tulips were planted, because what I've learned about these manure stones, the standing stones, is that there's chambers underneath. So possibly Paul would be in his chamber down in that area, or he could be directly right under the stone. So that, you know, again, it's all conjecture because I can't prove anything. So, but, you know, I have a feeling he could be down there, or it could be under the stone. But I, I do believe he's on this property, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, and I, I also want to uh, mention, and we mentioned this in the first show, but just to remind everybody that this farm was purchased by Biological Paul a, a few months before he died. Yeah. And uh, it was inherited by Billy. What makes Steve's theory very interesting is that it's hidden in plain sight. Yeah. Yeah. And some of the best secrets are hidden in plain sight because people look right past it. And I think it could very well be the case here that we have the standing stone. I think most people really don't understand what a standing stone represents. I mean, I didn't until, Steve, you brought it to my attention. You started talking about this. Yeah. I would say here in the United States, probably most people do not. And uh, so you would look past it. That's my point. If you don't understand it or you don't know then you're not going to think anything of this stone, which is sitting right in the middle of the field. You know, I, I, I think, Mike, too, that I, I also speculate that there's other bodies up there of who I don't know. But I, I believe that stone's been up there since ancient times. You know, I don't believe it was put there. I did a little bit of research and somebody else helped me with that. And he said it was there quite a while. And nobody really knows how long it's been there. So it is an ancient stone. It. You know, if they had uh, ancient sacrifices there or something, because all these stones were known to be that, too, where it would be an ancient sacrifice area. And then they would bury the bodies underneath. Maybe there's some kind of trap door leading up to that. One of the guys on my site mentioned something like that. Could be high tech, you know, just uh, an elevator goes down within the house or in the barns. And just speculation, but... Okay, so you're saying that it's it's a marker, could very well be a marker, and... There could be multiple bodies yes. laid to rest there. Yes, from ancient times. All right, so let's move to slide number 10, and I, I am going to completely botch this. Is it a Carn Cairn? I think it's Carn, but he would probably know better being in Scotland. Is it Carn it's or Cairn? Cairn. Okay, <laughs> Cairn. I hope I got that right. Steve or John or, or Ralph, I know Ralph will probably talk more with you as we get into some of the uh, into the morphs. So what exactly is a kiram? It's a burial mon monument. You know, again, what's it doing up on that hill? You know, obviously Bill spent a lot of time up there. I also remember in, in memoirs about him wanting to be close to Paul's spirit in order to uh, to feel his spirit in his music and everything. From what I remember, if, I, if I'm saying that correctly, maybe, Mike, you could interject in that. But I remember he wanted to be close to him. You know, basically these, these Karens or Karens are either sacrificial sites or, or burial chambers underneath, um, from what I've read, anyway. And like I said, Steve, you know, this 
ensures, if this is where biological Paul is buried, this really does ensure that he is indeed resting in peace, in my, in my mind, because it's, it's on the property, you know? Yeah, no doubt. I think it's peaceful there, you know? You know, John could attest to that. He said it's a little spooky, too, though, and I believe him. So tell us a little bit more about that, John. Why was it a little spooky? I don't know. It was just an eerie feeling, especially with the cracking and with crunching in the woods. Uh, I don't know. There was like any, maybe a wee feeling as if you were getting watched, but they weren't coming out to, to make their presence felt. They were just lo- watching you feet. Either in, inside the house or in the woods. Okay. Either that. The caretaker had just went to the pub for the day, I don't know. It was one or the other. Okay, so it wasn't the standing stone itself that was a little spooky. It was it was basically the feeling, as we talked about before, of maybe you were being watched and somebody was ensuring that you weren't being disruptive. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right, folks, and I'm going to repeat this because um, it's very important. Like I said, you know, we're doing this because of research. This should not become a tourist attraction. So I'm going to ask that folks be respectful of the Standing Stone and what it represents on the property. All right. So uh, slide 11, Steve, we talk about tombs and ancient rituals. This is some information you sent over to me. Could you tell us a little bit about this? Part of this was from Ireland. It says there was a very early prehistory practice of piling stones over the dead person's body rather than digging a grave. Later, in time, the Irish buried their dead in three types of tombs. And it says, a portal tomb, a number of upright stones covered by one or two capstones, and sometimes placed in a long or round mound. Passage tomb, uh, round mounds with burial chambers in the center, which were reached by a passage leading in from the edge of the mound. And hence, that's what I was talking about. If you were in the house or the barn and there was a trap door under the ground, leading up to to a tomb you know that's that's what i believe is under there you know I, a wedge tomb it says found an area of munster a type of chamber tomb where the chamber narrows at one end but there was also like a scottish tale too in a cave and i guess it had to be at low tide to reach it but there was uh, a bunch of people lost their heads in there you know it's like in ancient times in scotland there it says you know i i'm not going to read that whole paragraph i guess people can read it while it's up there but there were six decapitated victims, and that, that kind of made me think of Paul, where they said he lost his head or lost his hair in some of the songs, and it kind of made me think of that. I don't know why. It just tipped me off a little bit. And uh, some of the stuff is it's just ancient human sacrifices, you know? Yeah. One of the things that I've noticed is that uh, Billy is very clearly tied to and appreciates tradition. Yes. A lot of the information you're bringing forth here, Steve, ties into that tradition, and that's why maybe for some folks this might seem very weird and very strange. But you know, after you do the work and you study him a bit, uh, you understand that uh, you know he has an appreciation, a great appreciation, for his heritage, his ancestry, his uh, his lineage, his bloodline, and so what you're taking us through here does make sense to me. Yeah, me too. Yeah, let's put it this way. I mean, it's not certainly not out of the realm of possibility because of how he views his ancestry. Yes. All right, so let's move to the next slide, which is slide 12. This is kind of an interesting picture, Steve, and um, tell us about this. What were your thoughts when you, you put this together? It's a picture, you know, before Linda Eastman came to the farm, you know. It's probably the earliest picture I have up at High Park Farm that I could find. And at first I thought it was biological Paul, but then when you look at the date, May 1967, you say, no, it's not, it's Bill. You know, and of course the way that's written there says May 1967, Jane and Paul with Martha at his farm in Scotland. Paul had picked Jane up at the airport upon her return from her long North American tour with the Bristol Old Vic and immediately took her way up to this remote Scottish farm for some precious time alone together. You know, so this is the earliest pictures I could find. It didn't show the standing stone, but it's definitely the farm at High Park. Yeah, and that's definitely not biological Paul in that picture. Definitely Bill, yeah. And that's why I blew it up. I blew the faces up. Yeah. And this is what they have done in the past many, many times, especially when Billy was standing next to somebody who was much shorter. 
And the person he was standing next to was also somebody that Biological Paul had stood next to. And we have pictures and we can get an assessment of height, right? So, and now we know that Biological Paul was just a little taller than Jane Asher. And what they've done in this picture is we have Billy leaning. Yeah. He's leaning to the left as we're looking at him. It's his right. And this was done clearly to lower his height. Because if he was standing straight up, if we repositioned him, he would tower over Jane Asher, and it would be very clear that this is not biological Paul. That's correct, yes. Yeah. And the other thing, Steve, is I know we'll get into this a little later in some of the other slides, but is he holding a what we would consider a shepherd's crook as well? You know, I, I was going to bring that up. It looks a bit smaller than what we're going to bring up later. Yeah. To me, it doesn't look like that um, exact same relic, but we're going to get into that for sure. All right, so we're not sure then if the uh, if what he's holding there, it, it looks like a cane, obviously, but I was wondering if the cane was also uh, representative of the shepherd's crook, and we'll get into that a little later. The last thing I wanted to mention on this slide is that uh, he's wearing a shirt with the number 22 on it, and uh, 22 is a master number in occult numerology. So I don't think there's, there's any possibility that that was just by chance that he stuck on a, a sports jersey with the number 22 on it. And talking about the occult, we'll move to slide number 13, and we're going to shift away now from the farm, and we're going to get a little bit into uh, Alistair Crowley and uh, his possible ties into Billy. So slide 13, it's titled Crowley's Influence. And Steve, what do you want to tell us about this? Yeah, at, at first I, I didn't believe that Crowley was Bill's father. And the more you delve into it and the more you look around, there's tons of clues that make me believe he is. I happen to find this. This is somebody else's work on the right-hand side of that, beside the picture of Crowley. Yeah. If William is Crowley's son, Crowley would have been 62 when Billy was born, 1937. So he was my age then. So, you know, it's old to be having a kid, but it's possible. It says, we noticed similarities when comparing a young Crowley to James McCartney. The family bloodline ties could explain Crowley's influence on Billy and the Beatles. If not Billy's father, then he's a student of Crowley, because there's all kind of things through Bill's work leading to Egypt and all that, um, if you really look into it. Yeah, well, all of Crowley's, uh, his religion and his philosophy goes back to to the Egyptian mysteries. And you're right, Steve. Billy is uh, definitely an acolyte, a disciple of, of the Egyptian mysteries. His recent album, Egypt Station, uh, has all kinds of clues and symbolism that has to do with Egypt. Crowley died in uh, 1947. He died at the age of 72, and 7 plus 2 is 9. And in memoirs, of course, Billy tells us for the first 10 years of his life, he was tutored by Alistair Crowley. I don't know, to be honest with you, whether Crowley was his biological father. I, I believe it's very possible, but I will say that he is definitely bloodlined to Alistair Crowley. In other words, they share the same bloodline, going back up through William Wallace of Scottish warrior fame. And this was a clue that was given in memoirs in the Blue Book, the 9 after 909 edition. There is definitely this Crowley tie. All right, so in any case, what we'll do, I guess, is let's move to the next slide, slide number 14. All right, so on this slide, Osiris Risen, we have uh, an image on the right, and on that image we see Billy on the left, and that's Alistair Crowley in his ritual garb on the right, and we can see that they're making the Osiris Risen symbolism. This symbolism, uh, we see this within the entertainment and music industry, over and over and over again. In fact, if you did a search on the Internet and you searched Osiris Risen celebrities, artists, entertainers, you're going to get a ton of imagery showing this. Osiris Risen represents the pentagram, and it's the attitude of resurrection. Osiris is the Egyptian lord of the underworld and judge of the dead, brother, husband to Isis, and one of the most important gods of ancient Egypt. Osiris is the central figure of the ancient Egyptian religion, and the chief fundamentals of the cult were the belief in his divinity, 
death, resurrection, and the absolute control of the destinies of the bodies and souls of men. The central point of the religion of Osiris is the hope of a resurrection in a transformed body and of immortality, which could only be realized through the death and resurrection of Osiris. And at the bottom of the page, I inserted a note from Manly P. Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, and it says, The dying God shall rise again. The secret room in the house of the hidden places shall be rediscovered. The pyramid again shall stand as the ideal emblem of solidarity, inspiration, aspiration, resurrection, and regeneration. This is all tied into everything we see today, the occult symbolism throughout our reality, not just through the music business, not just through the entertainment industry. It's everywhere. We can see that the Egyptian religion, where Osiris is the, the central figure, is pervasive. So this chart in itself may not tie Billy to, uh, to Crowley as his father, but it certainly ties Billy into the religion of Osiris. You know, I, I think there's quite a resemblance to even Bill and Crowley. I know he's had surgeries done there, but there there were some morphs that were done that we did, and I know we're not using them on here, but, you know, even Stanshaw morph into Crowley and Bill into Crowley, there's definitely some resemblances when you put them together. I, I know we're not really showing them here, but I wanted to mention that if people want to dig and take a look, it, it's interesting to see the resemblances of how they look alike, you know, in many, many, many areas. Well, I have the morphs, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll put them in to the, uh, into the presentation. And, uh, and the thing too, Steve, even though Billy's had the surgeries, as we know, the surgeries, uh, are not holding together like they did when he was younger. No. <laughs> so in this picture, what we're looking at on slide 14 is a, a version of Billy where the surgeries are not holding together, and he's looking more like himself. Right. So if I compared this picture to what he looked like pre-surgery playing the Vivian Stanshall character, we would see a lot of similarities. Correct. So I, I think that your point that there are similarities between what Billy looks like and Alistair Crowley, if Crowley is indeed his father, it's, it's very possible. And like I said, what I'll do is I'll put the morphs in and the folks watching this, they can decide for themselves. All right, so on slide 15, uh, Steve, you sent me a copy of the Help album. Actually, it was an email you sent me. You talked about the occult symbolism on the on the Help album, and uh, I'll explain this, too, real quick. So when folks look at the Help album, they think in terms of, you know, they're spelling out the word Help, and uh, that's not what they're doing at all. In fact, the, um, the figures that you see above the Beatles I found on um, the Thelema, website, and you can see the uh, the link is down below if you want to check it out. And uh, these are ritual signs. So we have George Harrison in the first position. He's doing the Osiris slain or the cross. Also, George Harrison is wearing a top hat. A top hat is another symbol of Freemasonry. We have uh, John next, and he's doing Typhon, the trident. And Ringo is doing the earth symbolism. And that represents the god Set from Egyptian mythology. And then if we move over, we have Paul McCartney, biological Paul McCartney. He's doing the letter K. And the reason why he's doing K is because Alistair Crowley, when he referred to his magic, he added a K at the end. So it wasn't M-A-G-I-C. Crowley spelt his magic M-A-G-I-C-K. So what the Help album is actually representing and what it's symbolizing is Alistair Crowley's magic with a K. Amazing. And that's why they have Paul McCartney doing the K, because biological Paul McCartney was the sacrifice. So he's part of the magic. There is a magic aspect to the Beatles as well. So there you go, folks. That's the Help album. If you want to dig further, like I said, the link there is at the bottom of the slide, and I'll put it in the description box as well. You can click on it and take a look for yourself. Okay. Anything else, Steve, or anybody else wanted to add about this before we move on? Yeah. Um, there was a picture of Vivian Stanshall 
that's very similar to the Osiris character that's in these um, pictures right here, where he, which when I first saw these pictures and it's like, it's weird when we get clues with, um, with researching, it's like someone may post a picture and then within minutes, something pops up. Like I came across this picture with um, um, Vivian Stanchel where he's standing in a lake and he's wearing a black garb and he's not wearing a hood, but he's wearing a three pointed hat. And it's very similar. It just reminds me so much of this character of the Osiris. I, I know this. It seems like when, with the Vivian character, um, Bill is able to um, do a lot more on the Crowley on Crowley himself. Yeah, well, we'll get into that, Ralph, in a little bit. And uh, if, but if you have a picture of Stanshall, the one you're talking about, send it over to me. Okay. And I'll I'll slip it into the uh, into the presentation. Okay. Okay. Well, the net of it is, you know, occultism is all around the Beatles. The Beatles are immersed in it. And this is one of the aspects of the conspiracy that I've gotten into and you guys have gotten into that a lot of people have a lot of difficulty with. They're okay with going down the road that says biological Paul McCartney was swapped out. You know, it's like, oh, okay, uh, I can get my arms around that. But as soon as you start stepping down into some deeper aspects of this conspiracy, the magic, the ritual, the occultism, that's where a lot of people jump ship. I mean, they just are not comfortable with it. They don't want to accept it. It's very disruptive to their belief systems, their worldview. But the truth of the matter is, and you tell me if you agree, Ralph, the evidence is overwhelming that the Beatles were immersed in the occult. Yeah, I believe so, and everything was completely planned out. There's just no way there's this. There's so much, so many clues that we come across. And yeah, you almost think that you're crazy when you're, when you're researching this stuff. It's just, you almost don't even trust your own instincts at a certain point because it's, it's just, there's so many clues out there. And I can't believe that people have this much time to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was, it's one of the most elaborate psychological operations in modern times. Yeah. It really, really is. And as I've mentioned, um, you know, in a couple of other videos, that's why the McCartney and the Beatles conspiracy is so important to understand. It's not just about replacing a guy in the band. That's really a subplot for me. And I'm sure for you guys as well, because it goes way beyond that. You know, once you get into the other, pieces of the puzzle. As an example, you begin to understand very clearly the pyramid of power, secret societies, which includes Freemasonry, the Illuminati, Tavistock, of course, mind control, social engineering. It gets into the drug culture. We just talked about Alistair Crowley and his magic. There's occultism, which includes numerology. There's mysticism and rituals. And of course, it all gets wrapped up into Luciferianism and Satanism. And uh, again, that this is the dark aspect of this that a lot of people have a very difficult time with, but it is what it is. And uh, as you were saying, Ralph, you know, when we start to dig in and we look, it's all out there. When you don't know, it's easy to look past it. It's like what I was saying before about the standing stone. I mean, this is, the stone is there at the farm. And if you don't know what a standing stone represents, you don't think anything of it. But it's a clue that's hidden in plain sight. And it's the same thing with the Beatle album covers, as an example. I mean, there's no question, if you look at the Help album cover, and once we see the ritual signs that are Crowley's ritual signs from his rituals, his religion of Thelema, that's what they're doing. There's no question when we look at the second album with the Beatles, the UK release, that there's one-eye symbolism on all four Beatles on that album cover, you know, and it goes on and on and on. And we'll get a little bit more into Sergeant Pepper because uh, you guys gave me some, um, some great information, uh, additional clues on Pepper, occult symbolism, and we'll take the audience through that in a bit. So let's, let's do this now. Let's move to, uh, we're going to stay on Crowley and we're going to shift though from Crowley and we're going to kind of get into the whole Stanchel piece, Ralph. And so if we go to slide 16, and let me just shift back to Steve for a second, because uh, Steve had sent me this picture. What is going on here, Steve? When you got this picture, when 
you first took a look at it and you downloaded it. What were your thoughts as you were taking a look at it? Uh, another Scottish guy had posted this picture on, on my PID site, and uh, he didn't really see what I saw in it. He saw something totally different. I almost didn't do this video because of that because he totally thought this was something else. And uh, I still want to stand by it because what I see in it is the standing stone behind, behind uh, uh, Crowley's head. This is a Crowley self-portrait from the 1940s. What I think is interesting about it, somebody else thought it was a hat on his head, like a conehead type hat or Egyptian type hat. To me, I see his curly hair on the top, his curly reddish hair, if you really look close. You can see the different texture. And then you see that whole shape of a stone that I think, you know, John Lennox can say that's pretty equal to the shape that we've seen up on, you know, on the farm. At least from the pictures I see, it's definitely the same kind of shape. It bows at the top a little bit. It is painted brown where the stone is more gray. But, you know, I thought that stood out to me so quickly when I saw this painting. And then finding out it's a Crowley self-portrait. And then seeing, you know, what we're going to bring up pretty soon, there's a shepherd's uh, crook in there that he's holding. And I thought it was bizarre that it showed a, a head, like a beheaded person on it. And one person told me this might have been from, I, I believe, a potato famine or something like that. You know, so I don't, I don't truly know what he's trying to represent here. But I can tell you that that shepherd's crook is in a lot of pictures coming up that we're going to show. And that really floored me, too, the fact that this crook is in there. And it's exactly like the ones you're going to see in pictures coming up. And there's other symbolism in there, you can see. I, I don't exactly know who the other figures are in there, but I have some speculations that we'll see, too, coming up. Okay, okay. And then the thing about whether that's a point he had or not, uh, when I looked at the picture, Steve, I didn't think it was a point he had. And no. One of the things I've learned to do as I've gone through this whole process of analyzing images and pictures as I'm doing this whole Beatles conspiracy is is to take a look at everything that's in the picture. In other words, don't just focus on that. So as an example, if we look to the left where the, the hawk is, right, we believe that's a hawk, yep. that's also stone. And look how the stone was depicted, how it was painted with some beige, light brown, dark brown coloring, right? Yep. And we have the same coloring behind the head of Crowley. Yeah. So that tells me that that is indeed a stone because in other depictions of rock or stone in the image, that's how it was painted. Correct, yeah. Okay, so that's just my two cents on it. Now, we're going to move to the next slide, and I found this to be very, very interesting. So when you sent this over, I was like, okay, this is starting to make sense now. So let's move to slide 17, and wow. Was the Stanshall character based on Alistair Crowley? Yeah, it's funny. It never showed Alistair Crowley. It showed him bald or with a hat on, or didn't ever show him with red hair that I could see. Yeah, there, there is actually a morph Ralph did um, showing him with hair, but because it was black and white, you didn't see if he had reddish hair. Thought it was very interesting too. Just looks like the same character. Yeah. Well, let's move to slide 18, and we can really see the similarities. So there you go, folks. A side-by-side -side comparison of the self-portrait of uh, Crowley. And then to the right, we have a depiction of Vivian Stanshall. And we can see the uh, the eyes look very similar, the mustache, the beard. It's really very interesting. Yeah, it is. Another interesting fact, if, if you take a look at Bill's paintings, he almost paints in the exact same style as Crowley. You know, it, it, it's a little bit freaky. You go look through his paintings and then look through Bill's paintings, and it's almost painted in, I would say, the same medium or whatever, and, and just more flat, kind of almost uh, maybe impressionistic would be the word. It, it's it's almost the same style if you look how he paints. I think that's interesting, too. And on the previous slide, it, that stone is up on a hill, too. It looks very much like High Park Farm. I, I'd be willing to bet that's a painting depicting High Park Farm. Even though somebody else I know doesn't think so, I do. So I'm just saying my two cents on that. Well, it's your research and your yeah, presentation. My two cents. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I think it is that that place. You know. Yeah. If somebody else has a uh, different opinion, they should uh, they should come forth and present their different opinion. Right. Okay. And like I said, you know, we're going through theory here, folks. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's move to the next 
slide, and that's uh, going to talk about the hawk symbolism. And what about the hawk symbolism, Steve? When I see things in a picture like that, I really wanted to check out what symbolism of a, of a hawk is. And uh, it says, you know, here's here's how seeing hawks often may give insight into your life. And maybe you can read that better, Mike, on your screen because it's very small here for me if you want to read the depiction of a hawk, please. Okay, yeah. So it says that hawks scan their environment from high above the ground looking for potential threats and sources of food. If you see hawks showing up in your life frequently, it may be a call to see things from a higher perspective and focus on your observation skills. The hawk symbolizes the ability to use intuition and higher vision in order to complete tasks or make important decisions. Animal guides can deliver important messages to us from beyond, and hawks definitely serve as animals that can heighten our spiritual awareness and help us along our paths. I would say, Steve, that since Crowley was very much into symbolism, that the depiction of the hawk, along with everything else in the portrait, would certainly seem to be something he would do. And so I think everything that's in the portrait is there to illustrate a message. So in other words, what we see is supposed to be there. Yeah. All right. So that's so we, we talked about what we believe is the standing stone behind Crowley's head, the hawk. And I also want to mention, I forgot to bring this up. It looks like that uh, Crowley's flipping the bird. Oh, yeah. He's got his middle <laughs> finger up. And, uh, and we're going to talk about the shepherd's crook in a little bit. Now, there's two people in the um, in the portrait that we don't know who they are. But, Steve, you thought that perhaps if we go to slide number 20, it could be some royalty. Yeah. This whole Ar Argyle thing, you know, I believe they're, they are in uh, Billy's bloodline somewhere way back. But to me, that looks like the guy uh, next to him with the black hair, which is Archibald Campbell, the first Duke of Argyle. And I'm speculating Agnes Douglas, Countess of Argyle, is the lady in that picture because she has a nose and a chin very similar to that, if you take a look at it. And uh, Ralph actually put these paintings in another type of uh, conglomeration that I know we just wanted to focus on Stanshaw, but we put them all in. And I'm going to mention he actually put Paul's head on uh, on the shepherd's crook. You know, it was kind of powerful graphic, really. I thought it was interesting what he did with it, though. It's kind of interesting when you put it all together. Yeah. So, so Ralph, do you have that uh, morph? Yeah, I, I have. I have the picture, so I have to. I'll definitely send yes, it to you. Send that over to me too, and I'll I'll put that in. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to have a little fun with this. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if if you don't have some fun with this stuff. And you're not experimenting. The experimenting part of it is actually what helps to bring things together, right? Exactly. Because you have to think outside the box. If you don't think outside the box, then, you know, you're going to just see what you used to see. So if you want to see something differently, you know, you got to open the aperture of the camera. Yeah. Okay, so Steve, let's move to slide number 21 now, and it's the shepherd's crook. And just tell us a little bit about what that symbolizes, because we see that a lot with Billy. Yeah, so... Saw the shepherd's crook, and uh, I, I really thought I'd seen it before. It's kind of like a deja vu thing, type of thing. But what it symbolized, it says, uh, what does this shepherd's crook symbolize? The shepherd's crook stood for kingship and the flail for fertility of the land. By late pre-diasnic times, the shepherd's crook was already an established symbol of rule. The flail initially remained separate. Being depicted alone or on some earliest uh, representations of a royal ceremonial. So there again, it must be a royal ceremonial painting there, I would think. My take on it is that, based upon what we have on the slide here, that the crook is symbolic of kingship, royal ceremonies. So again, we're going back to royal bloodlines, blue blood yep. types of lineage. And that's what I believe is being depicted in the self-portrait of Crowley, and we're going to see this now with Billy as well. So if we move to slide 22, so just keep in mind, folks, the shepherd's crook, right? We're talking about blue blood, bloodlines, royal ceremonies, kingship, fertility of the land. And on slide 22, we see Billy has the crook, and this is from the Life magazine. Tell us a little bit about this, Steve. Yeah, this Life magazine was when... uh it was being said that Paul had died. You know, that's when the rumors first came to surface. And I guess a group of reporters went up there 
and they found him at his farm, High Park Farm, which is where that picture is taken um, with Linda and his children. It shows Heather, Linda's daughter, which he adopted, shows her holding that crook, the shepherd's crook. You can see almost the same coloration type of thing, even though these are black and white pictures, but you can kind of see that the, the rounded cane part at the top is light, like in the picture Crowley had in this painting. So I, I would think that this was a relic that was handed down through time, even possibly as far back as Egyptian times. It looks very Egyptian to me. I mean, I, I tried to research some other crooks like that, and it looks really old. It looks uh, like an old relic and maybe something from even their own bloodline handed down through time. It's also a shepherd type of thing, and you think of Billy Shepherd or Billy Shears. I thought that all kind of tied together, too. Now with the shepherd's crook, even the name of it, shepherd, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting that uh, on the Life magazine cover to the left, Steve, right above yeah. the handle on the crook, it says Paul and his family last week in Scotland. So, you know, when I look at stuff like this, I don't believe that it's by happenstance where they put words, how they take the picture, and and so on. So, I believe the wording above the handle on that crook is telling us Paul or Billy is Scottish. Yeah. And, and to take a look at that, that draws your attention with the words right there. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the other picture, I guess that was an alternative picture there where he's waving to the right. I don't think that's the one they used, but it's the same. You could tell it's the same clothing and everything. Yeah. But, you know, I knew I recognized that from the, uh, the painting. That's why I started searching around at the Life magazine cover. Yeah. Because I had seen that crook before, you know, and uh, it's exactly the same. And again, I, I go back to that picture we looked at with him at the farm with uh, Jane Asher. And we yeah. was it a cane or a crook? But yeah, I don't know. I think it was representing a crook. That's my take. All right. So then we go to slide 23 and uh, we have the shepherd's crook and the zebra. And uh, I could just take the audience through this, Steve, but yeah. it's the blend of the opposites. So zebras have black and white stripes. Black and white represent opposite meanings. Hence, they signify contradicting symbolism, just like black and white are two extreme poles. Zebras are highly adjustable to the situation. They can be both adaptable as well as determined when it comes to survival. Because of this, balancing attitudes in times of trouble, a zebra always finds its way out of a tight spot. Among many other things, zebra symbolism denotes that things are not as cut and dry as black or white, right or wrong. Everything must find balance in the world. Every aspect of life requires balance. And so when we talk about black and white, and I've discussed this many times in many presentations and shows, we're talking about duality. This is why we have the Freemasonic checkered floor. And in this picture, it's interesting, we have the, you know, the shepherd's crook, on the left, and that's from uh, Wikipedia. And then on the right, Steve, you supplied this image here of the zebra holding a shepherd's crook, which I found to be very intriguing. Well, reason reason I put that in there is that was on um, an I am a phony video. So, you know, I don't believe it's trademarked or anything, but to have that shepherd's crook in there, it looked like the same one on the cover. You know, it's got the light top again. It looks somewhat Egyptian. And then, so I, I thought it, the zebra has something to do with it, you know. I, I've even heard it rumored that Bill might be doing these I am a phony videos with somebody. I don't know if it's true. And I don't want to promote somebody else's videos. But, you know, he has some interesting videos that come out, too. And that was a still shot I did, you know, from that. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. Okay, no, very good. No, I am a phony is a very good site. And uh, I spent time myself looking through the videos and, and picking up on various clues. The only thing with I am a phony, a lot of people find it to be too cryptic. Yeah. And so it becomes a little difficult sometimes to pick out, you know, what's really going on and what the message is. But uh, in any case, yeah, I mean, I recommend it. I recommend there and, and my channel. <laughs> so, all right, let's move to the next slide. And we're talking about black and white and duality. And of course, Steve, we have, uh, well, Billy's Who Cares video, which is just oozing with occultism and Illuminati symbolism. No doubt. And I think the first thing I noticed in that video was all the black and white, and that, that's why I wanted to include the zebra in this this video we're doing. There was just a lot of the black and white throughout that whole video. 
you know, even the people's faces were planted with that, painted with that duality look to it. So they're definitely talking about the zebra, I believe. You're going to have to read that paragraph if you want to read that because it's real small on my printout. Yeah, no problem. I'll read it. So now we're taking a look. This is a still I took from the video, folks, from Billy's Who Cares video. We could see we have the hypnosis spirals in the background. In the memoirs of Billy Shears, Billy tells us that he was in a uh, trauma-based mind control program, his earliest memory going back to the age of three. And the other tip-off from the video and uh, this screen capture is you can see on his left lapel or left side of his body, he has the monarch butterfly, monarch mind control. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, the zebra, and the zebra represents love of freedom. So zebras love being free and wild. It is impossible to tame one, although people have made numerous attempts in the past. They will never let humans change that anytime soon. Human beings are born free. It is our fundamental human right to live our lives. The zebra animal symbol teaches us to love our freedom and not to be beholden to someone else's rule. Don't be crushed by false beliefs or let anyone dominate you. The zebra salutes those who have been through a tough time but kept their free spirit. It symbolizes the free and wild spirit that lives in everyone. Because of this trait, the zebra spiritual totem is a symbol of freedom. And this does tie into Billy because, as he explains in the memoirs of Billy Shears, he does talk about humans unshackling and stepping away from all of the rules that encumber the human race. Now, I'm saying this, folks, not because I'm embracing Billy or embracing Luciferianism. I'm explaining what he's telling us in the book. And, of course, Billy will explain in the memoirs of Billy Shears that he's gone through some very tough times, going through the transformation, becoming the character of Paul McCartney, leaving his old life behind, living a life of somebody else. And probably one of the major reasons, I believe, and I think the guys on the, on the call also probably agree, is the reason that he came out with the memoirs of Billy Shears is because no one knows who he really is. Nobody knows who William Shepard is, and he's the guy that's been playing the character of Paul McCartney since 1966. He's the primary replacement, I should say, through today, and everybody thinks this guy is someone who passed away 54 years ago. So the struggle in Billy's mind is real. So I think that that little passage there, Steve, that you sent over about the zebra and the one in the prior chart does tie in very significantly into Billy and his philosophies and where he's at right now, especially with regard to disclosure. Yeah. Yeah, because in memoirs, it's not just about Billy telling us about his struggles and what he had to go through. And I do understand that these were choices that he made. So I'm not siding with him one way or another. Like I've mentioned, all I'm doing is explaining what he is telling us in his narrative in the book, but also in memoirs, there's a lot of information, especially in the footnotes, that talks about the pyramid of power and talks about the deceptions, talks about the lies, the myth of the Beatles, the myth of the Rolling Stones, this whole black and white duality aspect of it, which is represented by the zebra, it ties in. All right, so... What we're going to do now on slide 25 is we're going to get into some yellow submarine clues above and beyond what we showed Steve in the first, in the first presentation. And I guess what we could do here is we could turn it over to Ralph because he's done some fabulous work to uncover something that I think is remarkable. So why don't we move to slide 26 and Ralph, if, if you wouldn't mind taking it from here and just Explaining what you did here would be great. All right. Okay. So um, I think this was actually after um, your guys's last uh, show. I think it was like that Saturday. We just start finding stuff, and um, Steve um, mentioned that look at his pants. <laughs> look at the, look at Paul's pants and in the album cover. 
it's it's the stone. And it's clearly um, representing, like, and most people do believe that the submarine represents a coffin. So in the, um, in the picture next to it, I went ahead and I got rid of everybody else, just kept the pants on there to see the stone, so you can actually see the stone itself. Um, I put Paul in the picture down below. And to me, as every, there, there's clues in everything that they do, it basically says – he's buried underneath a stone. It's just so clear once you see it. And I, I can't believe I, we haven't seen it before. <laughs> I'm sure somebody else has saw it before, but. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> this was really, this was, this was actually quite amazing. So, yeah. so Steve, you're the one that said, look at his pants. Yeah. I just noticed it, it looked like kind of like if, if you squint your eyes, even like I, I do that cause I'm an artist too. You squint your eyes, it kind of stands out even, you know, and it, his pants, the one leg is almost like the shadow of the stone. Right. And, you know, with uh, John being there, you know, he saw the stone better than us, but it is kind of like a long nine foot stone. It's pretty narrow from certain angles, you know, and it's up on the, up on the hill, you know, it's got the casket down six feet under, you know, so it, they're definitely trying to tell us something about this stone. Yeah. Well, the other thing I've noticed, the other thing I noticed, Steve, was, uh, if we look at the picture on the left, which is the Yellow Submarine album cover, look at the feet of the other Beatles, and they have their feet placed right near the base of the stone. So when you spoke earlier about the three stones at the base of the standing stone, the oh, you're right. stones at the base, right? I thought, wow, you know, I was looking at that, and I thought to myself, maybe, you know, maybe. But uh, in either case... The fact that you guys picked out his pants and said, we think that might be the stone and it's on a hill. And then, Ralph, I see you placed biological Paul McCartney's body in the yellow submarine. And we talked about this in the earlier show. In the first show, we said that uh, the submarine represents sub or below, subterranean. Yeah, right? exactly. So, and in the song Yellow Submarine, they talk about the sea of green well, the sea of green is a sea of grass buried below the grass. Really, this is fabulous. And we're going to show uh, another slide, folks, uh, in the next couple of slides where where Ralph uh, captured the morph. And you'll be able to see uh, how this maps to the slide I'm going to show you next. And on slide 27, guys, we have Linda McCartney's standing stone photo. And uh, so we have the horse. When we began the uh, the presentation here, we saw that Billy was in front of the stone and he was holding a horse by the reins, right? So the horse is symbolic of something as well. This is a picture of that Linda took, and you can see the stone in the background. And then what I did was I showed the back of Billy's album, which is titled... Paul McCartney's standing stone, and we can see Linda's picture was used for the uh, the back of that CD sleeve. Now, what I want to talk about is, uh, and this is important, I think, the album is called Paul McCartney's Standing Stone. So it's apostrophe S, meaning possessive. It's Paul McCartney's. It belongs to him. It's Paul McCartney's Standing Stone. The album didn't say Paul McCartney, Standing Stone. Nope. Like Billy's album, Paul McCartney, Flowers in the Dirt. Paul McCartney, Driving Rain. It's Paul McCartney's Standing Stone. So Billy is giving us a clue here. He's telling us this Standing Stone is tied to biological Paul McCartney. It belongs to him. Would you agree with that, Steve? 100%. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've had other... Other people that I feel are really prominent tell me that's the, it's his stone. I can't mention who they are actually, but you know, it's something that I believe it's his stone. Have confirmation, I feel like, you know, How, in what way? I don't know. It's a monument. Me, I thought it was something else than just a monument, you know? Yeah. Well, like I told you, Steve, this is the closest anybody's gotten yeah. to where he's buried. If he's not buried exactly under that stone, fine, but what you have done is you have narrowed the spectrum of where to look. Yeah. 
I'm wondering if I'm going to see anything about this in memoirs when he does an update, you know, so, like you had with the the Beatles music. You know, I wonder if anything will be put in there about this, the Standing Stone. When I did the uh, the video on the Beatles music, whether they wrote all their own music or not, what Tom told me was that um, as truth comes out, outside of Billy, in other words, truth is discovered and then it is communicated out into the public domain. This allows Billy to be able to disclose more. This is how it was explained to me. I don't know why that is. Maybe the contract is written in a way, or maybe the green light that he has received to disclose says that if truth comes out, then you can expand on it. You can talk about it. You can allude to it. Right. All right. So it's possible now. It's very, very possible that if Memoirs gets updated again, which I think it probably will at some point, that this will be brought in. It's very possible. Let's move to slide number 28 now. And we know that in conspiracy research that the Simpsons drop a lot of clues. And here, Steve, you picked up on this one here. So tell us a little bit about what caught your eye here. You know, it's interesting to watch that whole cartoon. You, you can still find it on YouTube. You know, going back to the whole thing, uh, with the tulip plantings that I believe are up there. Seeing that spade, that's an individual spade for planting bulbs. So it's very odd that he has that in his hand. It's not like a mason's tool, like it could, people could interpret it that way. But to me, it's a bulb planting apparatus shovel, you know? So, and the other one is for planting a bigger bed, but that particular type of shovel is for planting one bulb at a time. So it's a very unique shovel. It, it's definitely for planting bulbs. And I thought it was odd that it's in there, you know. No, it is very strange that it's in there. I, I, I would agree. And then you have a, um, a screen capture of the video of where Billy was planting those bulbs. And I'll rerun that video again so people can see. Okay, so I'll, I'll insert that into the presentation. All right, so on slide 29, Steve, tell me about this. I, I put this together, and uh, I was I was assuming that I, I know where you were going with this, but why don't you just – Tell me what your thoughts were. Yeah, this is um, really more of a Ralph thing. Maybe I should let him speak. Okay, so um, on the last presentation, yeah, I know mean, you guys were speaking about this John Lennon photograph, and we were trying to figure out possibly there was a message down below. So I was like focusing on this picture over and over. Then I looked at the then I lo looked at that photograph, and I'm like, it's like a mirror image of this um, photograph. And basically what I did, I just inserted the dog, Martha and Paul, Billy, in the other picture. And it's instead of having like we thought possibly that's a stone, the standing stone behind um, the left shoulder. It looks like John did a put a sun behind it. I, I don't know what the dates are exactly if this would um, if this is after this photograph was taken. But I do believe John was true to this. And, um, and, and showing the clues again on the head. It's just, again, it's just straightforward. And also, I know like we did a, um, a mirror image on the bottom of the, um, of the feet of the drawing. And it came to us, I don't know, I, I believe it looked like a skull on the feet of the drawing. Okay, I have that. And I'll, I'll insert that in, Ralph. But it's just very, it's just very, um, you know, like with John's drawings and, and even like with Bill's paintings, they're, they're not, I'm not going to say they're the top quality, but there's a lot of little clues in there. <laughs> there's a lot of clues, and that's the thing with him. Everything he does has symbolism in it. Mm -hmm. Everything he does. And a lot of people have a hard time with that. Everything he does, Mike. Everything he puts out as far as records and stuff like that and album covers and so on, when he does interviews, he masterfully speaks, he puts a lot of stuff out there. And it just takes looking at it and beginning to understand the symbolism you can start to piece it together. So with this, I can see, you know, where you've gone with this, and I, I think you're probably right. So he was doing uh, an an iteration or version of John Lennon's drawing. That's what I got out of it. Yeah. Ralph, we're going to stay with you because this um, next slide steps us through the uh, your morph of the Beatles' Yellow Submarine album and then to Linda's photograph of the uh, – of the Standing Stone. So, folks, just for point of reference, the bottom right is the Yellow Submarine album, as you know. First of all, 
maybe you could do this. Explain how you do these these morphs because uh, they're fascinating. How do you do them? <laughs> it's funny because it's like I'm just using my phone. <laughs> I'm not even using my computer. Um, I have a better graphics, uh, I have a better um, program on my computer, but I just been using my phone. I just I just take screenshots of. Um, I have one program where I do a layer. It's called Layers, I believe. And I just go ahead and I um, put the photographs on top of each other and I lower the opacity on the picture that's going to morph into it and just do screenshots. And then I put it through a GIF or GIF, however you want to say it, program, and it just puts it together. And it, it takes maybe like not even five minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. And so we have you have picture number one there is, you know, you, you took out the rest of the Beatles and we just have uh, uh, Paul's, his his legs, right? Yes. And uh, number two, we're starting to bring in Linda's picture. And three, more of Linda's photograph. Four, we're really starting to see Linda's photograph. And then it's almost a direct map to Paul's pants on the Yellow Submarine album. Yes, I believe so. And even the the hand on the um, – there's the hand pointing to the Beals and the album cover is – I mean, it's a little lower, but – it, it kind of reminds me of the horse. You can see a little bit of the horse in the morph, and um, it almost looks like the horse's head. Yep, yep, okay, very good. All right, so uh, I think I have the morph of this as well, and I'll insert that into the video. Okay. So people can see it in real time versus looking at the stills. All right, slide 31, we have some occult hand signs and the letter P, on the sub, and um, you know, of course the, the hand signs that they're doing. We've got Billy doing the uh, the six 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 sign, and we've got John holding up the the sign of Baphomet. And again, the P is on the sub. And so, Steve, I I guess what you're saying here is that the P on the submarine represents Paul McCartney. Yeah, and something something else came to me later. Yeah, the P definitely represents Paul, and. What I thought was interesting about this, when you think of, uh, there's usually four pallbearers carrying a casket. And you think Paul, you know, the word Paul, and then Paul bearers, <laughs> you know, and they're holding up this submarine casket, you know, as if they're holding it up and they're going to carry it to a grave. So those kind of things come to me pretty quickly, you know. I look at it, and I feel that's real symbolism for that, too. You know, I could be wrong again, like I always say, but I feel like they're holding it up. And uh, at least the back two are, George and uh, Ringo are. Yeah. And P being represented as the body in there. Well, the other thing that I noticed was this is a 45 RPM sleeve. So we have Yellow Submarine and Eleanor Rigby, yep. which is another Paul is Dead song. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> okay. So let's move to the next slide. And what I can do here, guys, is I can read this. And um, I actually found this on Wikipedia, and I found this to be very interesting. So when we talk about uh, the Beatles and what the social engineering and the cultural changes were all about, one of the primary results that they wanted out of the Beatles and Beatlemania was to dislodge Christianity. So in the memoirs of Billy Shears, we are told that the Illuminati declared war on Christianity back in 1962. And of course, 1962 is the official start of the Beatles. So I'm going to read this. This comes from Wikipedia. According to the band's press officer, Derek Taylor, all four Beatles had abandoned their religious upbringings by 1964. In an interview for the Saturday Evening Post in August of that year, he stated that the Beatles were completely anti-Christ. I mean, I am anti-Christ as well, but they're so anti-Christ, they shock me, which isn't an easy thing. In February 1965, the band gave an interview to Playboy magazine, in which they defended themselves against claims that they were anti-religious, while at the same time emphatically declaring themselves to be agnostic. McCartney, we probably seem anti-religious because of the fact that none of us believe in God. Lennon, if you say you don't believe in God, everybody assumes you're anti-religious, and you probably think that's what we mean by that. We're not quite sure what we are, but I know that we're more agnostic than atheistic. Playboy, are you speaking for the group 
or just for yourself? Lennon, for the group. Harrison, John's our official religious spokesman. McCartney, we all feel roughly the same. We're all agnostics. Lennon, most people are anyway. McCartney, in America, they're fanatical about God. I know somebody over there who said he was an atheist. The papers nearly refused to print it because it was such shocking news that somebody could actually be an atheist. Yeah, and admit it. Star. He speaks for all of us. So this is very interesting to me, guys, because this goes right along with what we're told in memoirs. And we can see here that this is a process of dislodging a religion, Christianity, that is very embedded in American culture. And we can see that the war that they spoke about, that the Illuminati began in 1962, it certainly appears that the Beatles were reading that script. Any questions from you guys? Anybody have anything else they wanted to add? Yeah, if I could, um, just quickly. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when the first video came out, I started reading some of the comments, and there was, there was comments recently that, that somebody posted there. It almost said something in, to the effect that after reading memoirs, um, this one lady, I don't have her name, but she felt like she had to be, had to have her book anointed, you know, with by a priest type of thing. So, because she believes there's, uh, magic attachments to the book. And I, I know I'm getting off on a tangent here, but I almost feel a bit obsessed with this now too, after reading memoirs. And, and you wonder how much magic was put into that book even, you know, because I haven't been able to put anything down about this. It's constantly in my mind every day by, you know, going off on a tangent, but I thought it was interesting what she said on that and the whole magic thing. It, it definitely could have something attached to it, non-Christian like, you know, so, you know, it's a little bit spooky. I thought I'm a Christian myself. I'm not really into anything devil like. So this whole thing is a little bit dark to me. Just saying what I think. No, Steve, I have received uh, emails and comments saying the same thing, that they started reading the book and they had to actually stop reading it and put it down because they felt so uncomfortable with it. And I've also heard comments that, you know, they believe that the book does have occult magic built into it, embedded into it. And I'm going to say that's probably so. Right. This is an area of research that is difficult to step out of once you get into it. Yeah. Because it puts you in a position where you constantly think that there's more to find, and there is more to find. Yeah. Now, I can tell you that it took me a while to step back from it, and I have stepped back from it. I'm doing this presentation, and I've got maybe another three or so that I'm going to, uh, to put out to wrap things up. But I will say this. It is dark. Yeah. And it is important that you don't spend too much time with your head in this rabbit hole. The way I've approached this is I've gotten to the point with this where I feel like I understand it, I've got it, and now it's time to move on and to go tackle other things, other areas of research, because this particular topic can become all-consuming. And there are pieces of this which are not healthy from, I think, from a spiritual perspective, and maybe even from a mental and emotional perspective. It really depends upon the person, how strong the person is mentally to be able to look at this conspiracy and compartmentalize it. That's what I've done. I've compartmentalized it. I try not to, uh, to spend too much time just swimming in it, because if you do, it will bring you down, because there is darkness to it. No doubt. All right, so I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. And uh, you sent this one over, Steve, and it's all in the mind, you know. And, of course, this goes along with, it maps in very nicely with the Aquarian conspiracy. It's all about the age of Aquarius, the rise of the phoenix, and the phoenix is Lucifer. It's the rise of Lucifer. All of this stuff is put out there. Many people have no idea what it means. If we think about it's all in the mind, you know, and we think about the New Age movement. We think about the Esalen Institute, which comes in under Tavistock. It is all about the mind. Okay, so we'll move to the next slide now. And slide number 34, we have uh, Sergeant Pepper alternative album covers, and there's more symbolism. And I don't know, Steve, or 
Anybody else wanted to talk a little bit about this? Where are we going with this? First of all, I didn't know there was ever alternative covers to Sgt. Pepper. But, you know, Google is a really good thing because you can find a lot of things out there. And I, I saw like these, uh, I think there's like three or four different different cover options. And I, I can't use the person's name again, but this man was saying that there's a fifth beetle kind of embedded where the wax figures are of the younger beetles there. It shows like a shadowy image, which is probably the wax beetle head. But even when nobody's there, there's still even one behind Paul McCartney's head. Behind his head where you could see, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the actor's name with the hat on there. Marlon Brando. Yeah, Marlon Brando. You know, if you look down below him to the right a little bit, you, you can see kind of a little bit of a shadowing even behind the wax figure's head. The feeling is, I guess, is that, you know, Bill is the fifth Beatle and there's now five instead of four. If we look at the image on the right, we have Billy standing to the left of the drum. Behind him is the wax of biological Paul McCarty. You could see the top of his head. Right, which is kind of that shadowing again. Shadowing, and it's also, I think, symbolizing that they are one and the same. In other words, Billy is now Paul. Yep, took his place. Took his place. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, in the other one, Paul's kneeling. I thought that was interesting because, you know, when I, at least when I go to a Christian burial, you kneel down on your knees at, at like the, uh, casket. And I thought it was strange. It's only Paul kneeling down there. I mean, Bill, um, kneeling down by the, where he'd be buried. So in other words, you know, he's kneeling down and taking his place kind of, you know, paying respects to him sort of. The other thing I've noticed with these alternate album covers, these from the photo shoot is that Billy looks less like Paul McCartney in his alternate shots. And I think you're right. Right? So if you look at the picture on the right, and even the picture on the left, it's off. Yeah. And uh, so I think with the final album cover, what they did was, number one, they decided, okay, this is the picture we want to go with. And two, they did some work. However, they were able to do it back in 1967, maybe to airbrush or to make some adjustments to the to the album cover to make Billy look more like Paul. But in the alternate covers, it is off. He doesn't look like he does on the, the album cover that finally was released. Yeah. All right. So let's move to slide number 36. And this is something you sent over. I found this to be kind of interesting that there was some mirroring that was done. Now, who did this? Was it Ralph? Did you do this or? Um, that was already out there. I, I just thought it was kind of interesting on the cover. Somebody else had done that. I don't know who to give credit to on that. Almost like the walrus is biting off half the child there. And there's also the symbolism of three legs there, sort of, too. And, of course, the walrus was Paul type of thing. You know, that's all tying into it. There's a lot of mirroring that you can do on the Sgt. Pepper album cover. Yeah. And you'll get these types of things. I mean, the main one, of course, that everybody knows about is the mirror going horizontal across the drum. And that's how we get the 9-11 date and he die. And I'll, I'll slip that into the presentation so folks can take a look. Okay, so let's move to slide uh, 37. And we have more Alistair Crowley symbolism. And so, folks, what we've done here is we have the Sgt. Pepper album cover on the left, obviously. And then we have this middle picture, which is a phallic symbol. And then the smaller picture to the right is from the Crowley self-portrait. So, Steve, the middle picture where we have the phallic symbol made of the flowers, this comes from the Sgt. Pepper album cover, correct? Yes. Okay, so what I did was I laid in a picture of Alistair Crowley's signature, and that actually comes from Wikipedia. And we can see that when, when Crowley signed his name, the A in Alistair, he wrote it as a phallic symbol. Yeah. And what we're seeing is his signature, the A, maps to the middle picture, which is a mirror of a portion of the album cover, and it looks very much like the middle picture, like his signature on his self-portrait, which is to the right. So the point being, folks, it's like, okay, Mike, what's the point? The point is we have more Alistair Crowley symbolism on the Sgt. Pepper album cover, not just a cutout of him in the upper left-hand corner of the album. You can see the arrow pointing down, the yellow arrow. But we have other symbolism embedded in the Pepper album cover that is tied to Alistair Crowley. 
it really does strengthen the argument that Crowley was very much tied into the Beatles, or I should probably say the Beatles were very much tied into Alistair Crowley. All right, so slide number 38. First, we should say that in memoirs, Billy tells us that both bands, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, were a creation of Tavistock. Give me your thoughts about this slide. Yeah, on, on, on Magical Mystery Tour, it, it kind of shows um, a cartoon of the Beatles, which I think you'll get to in one of the next slides. Mick Jagger's wearing the same kind of hat as John Lennon is. It's almost identical. It has like a moon, kind of magical type wizard hat. And then on the clothes, you know, this is not new information, but, you know, it's odd that the Rolling Stones have pictures of the Beatles during a Sgt. Pepper time on their clothes, you know, and you did a, a blow up of that. Yeah. To show they're both tied into Tavistock and both created, and, and especially the name of that, that Rolling Stones album, Satanic Majesty's Request, you know, a lot of satanic type things in, in all this, you know. It's really in your face, right? It's yeah, it's unbelievable. And I should point out, folks, that if we look to the image on the right, we can see in the upper left, we can see Saturn, Saturn worship, which goes back to Satanism. We'll go to the next slide. And this is the image you were talking about, Steve, from the Magical Mystery Tour booklet. And we have uh, Mick Jagger to the left with the uh, witch's hat with the, with the moon on it. And I titled the, uh, the chart Wizards and Magic. Correct, yeah. But the same kind of moon shape, I think, on it, yellow moon with a black hat. Yeah. And the other three Beatles have red hats. So I don't know if that makes John Lennon more powerful. You know, he was the leader of the band, and I would say Mick Jagger was the leader of the Rolling Stones before Billy took over, at least. So. Yeah, so again, folks, if, if you're looking at this, you've got to get past thinking that this is just coincidental. Right. The dressing the Beatles up, even in cartoon form, in uh, wizards' costumes, which is actually in the film itself, and you've got Jagger on the cover of the Stones album, their Satanic Majesty's Request. This is planned stuff, right? These are clues, and this is symbolism that is put out there. It's again, it's hidden in plain sight. So everybody needs to start asking themselves, what is this stuff? Why is it out there? What are they telling us? And the smarter we get about it, the more we're going to understand about our reality. So this was a good one, Steve, putting the two bands together and, and showing the um, the connections. Now, on slide number 40, this is a little creepy. So uh, what about slide number 40 here? When I was Googling, I found a Claus Warman picture from the Revolver era because he did the cover of Revolver, but this was an alternative cover. And it shows Bill, actually, I believe, because of the beard and everything, as Paul McCartney laying down dead, you know. It, to me, it shows it that way, under George's beard there. You know, I thought it was so much like Rosemary's Baby's cover and the Imagine cover. They're, they're definitely all tied in together. And John Lennon living at the Dakota in New York City at the time, that's where Rosemary's Baby was filmed. Right. You know, in that building, so... There's some ties to Satan's child or something. I, you know, they're trying to say something. Uh, I don't know what you think, Mike, of all that. So similar, you know. So. Well, again, Steve, it's it's not coincidence that we have Lennon on the Imagine album. We have Klaus Vorman making the alternate Revolver album cover. Right. Depicting the back of the album cover of Imagine. Yep. Right. And, and these are years apart. And then looking identical to the movie poster for Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. Okay, so I guess people can say, oh, it's all coincidence, but it's not all coincidence, and it's all tied in, and it is tied into Satanism. Yeah. That's my take on it, okay? It's, this is not coincidence. This was planned. This is specific symbolism hidden in plain sight. All right, so we've gotten through some more occulted beetles and symbolism and we'll let the audience decide for themselves or if they want to do some of their own research and dig deeper well i'll leave that to to the audience but we're going to shift now to something that ralph's been very involved in and we're going to talk about vivian stanshall i believe more and more people now are really starting to see that billy was vivian stanshall who played in the bonzos and i'm on slide number 41 now guys so just to give a little background, 
there were two Vivian Stanshaws. There was the version of Stanshaw that played with the Bonzo Dog Band with Neil Innes. That was Billy who played that version of Vivian Stanshaw. And there was another Vivian Stanshaw that was on Billy's payroll that didn't play in the Bonzos, but he did his own music because he was a musician as well, and he also was in films. And that version of Stanshaw that I refer to as Street Viv, his first name, if we take a look at Wikipedia, is Victor. So we shall refer to him as Victor. But we're going to focus on the Stanshaw who played in the Bonzos. And uh, this was a, uh, a comparison that was sent to me. I did not put this together. I believe I received this in an email or a, a PM, and somebody said, hey, Mike, take a look. And so we have Stanshaw or Billy playing Stanshaw on the left with his red hair. And then we've got Billy playing McCartney. This was his uh, mullet era. And then we have uh, a split a comparison between Stanshaw and uh, and Billy on the far right. So I don't know, guys, when I saw this, I thought it was one of the best proofs that Billy played Stanshaw, and Stanshaw is Billy. What are your thoughts? Uh, let me start with, uh, with Ralph. What did you think when you saw this one? I, 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 I was... Um... Actually annoyed that I didn't find these pictures myself. <laughs> um, because I, it's a, it's an obsession because when you first see, um, Bill next to, um, and Vivian, a lot of people don't see it and it's really hard. And I think one of the easiest things at first is if you start focusing up on his, um, upper brow compared to, um, Paul's, then you can kind of see it from there. And then you got to work down the eyes and then you can see the guy's characters pretty close um this this just shows this just proves everything right here uh, it's just great great comparisons it's 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 really it's really funny how they trick how you trick you and i think it's also growing up i'm born in 71 so the beatles were already finished by then um so i always saw the two different i saw the two different pauls as one because that's how, you know, your program, it's like a, right. it's like a new, a new car model. Like this is the 1966 model. Here's a 68 model. And it's like the same, it's a Mustang. Once you see um, Vivian, it's, it's, it's so clear. It's so clear. Like I cannot not see him anymore as a two different characters. One of the telltale signs that uh, I point out to folks is that Billy has a somewhat lazy left eye, kind of wanders a little bit. And um, there are, photos and images where you can see that the eye does that. So, and we can see it in this particular picture. So on the left, we have Billy playing Stanshall and take a look at his left eye, which is on our right. And you can see it kind of drifts a little bit to the left. Yeah. Right. And then look at the middle picture and we can see the same thing where that eye is kind of drifting a little bit uh, to the left or Billy's left would be our right. You know, so that's one of the, the telltale signs. And it's very interesting with this one, the nose at this point still looks very similar, which means that uh, the rhinoplasty and, and the, the surgeries that Billy had to, to narrow the nose, especially the, the, the end of the nose with the flare of the nostrils, uh, wasn't quite there yet at this point. And you made a good, very good point, Ralph. We would just take a look at McCartney over the years and say, oh, you know, that's him. He just looks differently. And the reason why he looks differently was because, if you think back, Billy was always changing up his appearance, which I believe was part of the plan to make it more difficult to be able to to make the comparisons. But in any case, yeah, so I, I thought this was a, a great depiction. And so for all of those that still don't want to believe or, you know, or embrace the fact that Billy played Vivian Stanshaw of the Bonzos, here you go. And if you still don't see it, I don't know what to tell you. So we'll go to slide 42, and, and Ralph, this is your work here. So w what did you do here? Again, I just placed um, the two pictures on top of each other, lowered the opacity so you can – yeah, I lined up the faces. And the thing when lining up with um, Vivian is – and Bill's face is that it just lines up. Once I put the eyes on the eyes, that's it. The nose, the mouth, everything lines up perfectly. You can try to do it on other people. It doesn't work. Yeah. You know, Try to do it with um, Paul, and it doesn't work. 
it just always fits in. And it's, and that's what's the fun, like even almost just like that stone, that stone on the um, cover with Linda's um, picture, it's just lined up. Yeah. Everything's with Vivian. It's, you can't, you can't deny it. You really can't. But when you see him perform, it's a completely different character, which is very impressive. It is very impressive. That's the thing. Billy is a performer. He's an entertainer. And he, you know, he pages in and out of multiple characters. It's, it's really very interesting. But one thing you said, which was very key, is that when you do the overlays, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the chin, they all map, which means what, Ralph? It means we're dealing with the same face, right? Yeah, definitely. There's no question about it. Okay, so slide 43, this one says the eyes say it all, and we have, again, we have an image of Billy on the left, and then we have Vivian on the right. The image of him on the right is another uh, run at Christianity. We can see that he has the uh, the tape on his feet and his hands from being crucified. So I guess what we'll do is we will move to the next slide, 44. And so, Ralph, what you did here was, again, you took Billy's face from the prior chart, and then you started to overlay it with Vivian Stanshall, and again, we have a match. Yeah, it's just, it, it lines up perfectly. And it's kind of funny because at a certain point, it almost looks like um, Robin Williams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so slide 45 is uh, a more step-by-step -step depiction of that particular morph. And uh, yeah, there you go. That's uh, That's the same guy. Yeah. And like I said, when you watch them perform, and I, now I'm like a big fan of the Doodah band. They're a very interesting band. It's almost like the Mothers of Invention on the East, on the, in England. <laughs> oh, they were very talented, and Neil Innes was uh, very talented. And of course, Neil Innes was in the Doodah band with Billy, but Neil Innes was also uh, the brains behind the Ruddles. Yes. Okay. So if you don't know him from the Doodah band, then, uh, or the Bonzos, you will know him from the Ruddles. He played the character Ron Nasty. He played the John Lennon character. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right? <laughs> Great. I know we were, we were trying to watch, um, the other day on Amazon, uh, what was it? The Bee Gees Sergeant Pepper came on. Oh my God. It was my son and I, like my younger son, he's just turned 11 and he's been, he's been into this. And it's kind of nice to see it with fresh eyes from a child. Because he can definitely see the two different characters. He's like, they don't even look alike. Yeah. So he's, he does it. He's not brought up with them. But watching that film, oh, wow. There was no, there was no clues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, George Martin was very, very involved in that film. And also Bernard Purdy drummed on many of those tracks. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, very interesting, <laughs> right? So Bernard, Bernard comes back to drum on Beatles songs. All right, so we have possibly another graveyard at High Park, and I don't know, John or, or Steve, who would like to comment on this to set it up? Uh, there was lots of wee areas like that, but there was loads of the same type of stone as the standing stone was made from. So I don't know whether they were graveyards as such or what they are. They've maybe been quarried or something, I don't know. But they were similar types of stones. They were identical type. Okay, but they were smaller. Oh, aye, yeah, they were a lot smaller. All right, and then on slide 47, daffodils at High Park, and uh, Steve had mentioned that he believes in the video clip from many years ago where Billy and Linda are planting that they were most likely planting daffodils. Do I have that right, Steve? Actually, I thought it was tulips. Tulips, okay. Another theory here is John noticed some yellow flowers there with his wife while he was up there. You know, it could could be in that same area. I don't know if that was near the burn. I, I have to verify that with John again. If it's down near that stream, below to the left of the standing stone, was it, John? The standing stone is at the front of the house, and the, those yellow flowers were at the rear, rear of the house, like the back garden. So over at the rear, that's where I reckon the burn was running. So I would imagine that's where that plant was taking place. I don't think it was near the standing stone. I think it was the other end of the farm. So while this is speculation... You know, mums bloom around this time of year. It, it could be mums, um, daffodils, but that, daffodils bloom much earlier. You know, same time as tulips, really. Um, so I doubt they're, they're daffodils. But without him getting closer, you can't really see it. It's very blurry because I blew up the picture quite a bit that I sent you. You can see yellow there. It could even be that the caretaker there has been asked to put flowers maybe in some kind of urn to put something there just as remembrance to him. 
you know, or, you know, it's like a planted pot of mums, yellow mums or, or whatever, just to mark the place. You know, again, if he's in a chamber type of thing, maybe that's where he is. If it's near that berm where they were jumping on. Yeah. Maybe they have flowers continuously up there. You know, that, that would be my thought. He did really feel like they were flowers. Okay. So that's, that's interesting. And, uh, we'll leave this slide there and folks can, uh, can chew on it a bit and, uh, come to their own conclusions. Let's move to slide 48. Now, um, I think, Steve, this is something you wanted to talk about. You mentioned that uh, you have a theory, or at least some thoughts, where John Lennon might be buried. Yeah. You know, they, they said that he was cremated, but it did show a body also of him, you know, that I I believe Ralph has a picture of that. It's a possibility that John's body might have been uh, transferred over to Strawberry Fields in Beaconsfield Road, which is over in England. In Liverpool, but I was tipped off about Beaconsfield Road. Uh, I won't say by who, but you know something big is supposed to happen there eventually. So the only thing I could figure, I don't think it has to do with Paul. I think it has to do with John Lennon, or possibly both of them. I'm doing a lot of conjecture here, but it was an orphanage that was either burned down or torn down by you know with age. It was supposed to be the playground of John Lennon. So it was an important area for him to play in because he lived close by to there. Um, and John actually just recently went to these areas. I was having him look for rhododendrons, and he could not find one rhododendron there. So, And it says something in memoirs about if you want to find Paul or something, look under the rhododendrons, or you know, which kind of throws you off on the standing stone, too. I was almost wondering if I was being thrown off the path by this tidbit of information about Beaconsfield Road. I, I don't know for sure. Okay. Okay. And the other thing we have to you know keep in mind is that Memoirs does have threads of fiction in it in order to um, to keep the fictional aspect of the book in place so that Billy does not breach his confidentiality agreements that he signed, right? So the rhododendrons could be a ruse. And you said, Steve, that something you, you heard or somebody told you that something big would happen at Beaconsfield Road? What do you mean by that? Without getting into revealing sources, what, what does that mean? I, I was just told, like, even after Billy passes, something's going to come up about Beaconsfield Road. Okay. So that intrigued me, and all three of us have been trying to hunt and find clues or anything about this. The only thing really Ralph saw was that there's four different designs on that gate, and that's a replaced gate. I guess somebody stole it. So, and the four beetles or something, it might have something to do with that gate, that being that way. Oh, by, by the way, before, you know, about the Beaconsfield Road, when, when John just took his trip, I think it was last weekend, and uh, there was a red door also on McCartney's door. So, you know, at his childhood home. Okay. Bit odd, same color paint, too. So just wanted to say that might be another slight clue. Yeah. You know, because John Lennon's door wasn't that color, right? believe um no but they maybe they had paint left over from when they did billy's farm could be, could be. <laughs> i also have this theory and somebody else does too that it's possible that um paul mccartney and john lennon were orphans themselves and you know it's funny because you know the parents died early if you look at a lot of pictures of paul mccartney's father that bill was with in a lot of the pictures he looks like three different people yeah so there could have been other actors. I mean, if Bill's playing an actor part, maybe the family was actors. It's a possibility. Two orphans and no history of them, and they could just start fresh, mind control. That was just a, you know, conjecture on my part again. No, it's okay, because I had said that, um, you know, I've, I've gone on record to say that I have a theory that the Beatles were in a mind control program from early on. Yeah. You know, I, I've said this, and, um, I mean, it's there's really no way to prove it, but there are clues. As an example, I think I mentioned this on the previous show or certainly on, on other shows that I've done. We have images of uh, biological Paul McCartney and George Harrison with bird cages over their heads. Bird cages are symbolic of Illuminati mind control. It's not just that they decided to put bird cages on their heads and then be photographed at a photo shoot. So, again, symbolism is being communicated out. Yeah whether it be to us or to the inner circle. So I wouldn't discount the theory that John and Paul, specifically, maybe George, maybe Ringo, who knows, but we'll focus on Paul and John, were orphans 
and possibly subject to a mind control program. Right. Because I have said, you know, that the official narrative that we're given was written by the very same people that gave us the PSYOP, that created the Beatles, and then created an entire backdrop, an entire fictional story about how it happened. Right. Four middle-class scousers from Liverpool get discovered by a small record shop owner who then goes about trying to sell a demo tape. The four lads wind up with EMI under the tutelage of George Martin, achieve superstardom. I mean, that whole story is a Cinderella story that is complete fiction and it's myth. Right. In fact, Lennon has told us so many times in, in a number of interviews that the Beatles were a myth. He calls it the Beatles myth, the McCartney myth, the Dylan myth. So anyway, so very interesting. We'll have to see, you know, what happens if anything happens with this. If you guys find anything, you know, just let me know and we can you know, get together again and talk about it. So that brings us to the very last slide. And uh, Steve, I know you have some final thoughts and then we can go to Ralph and to, to John to see uh, how they want to wrap up. But what are your thoughts, Steve? Yeah, and that, that final slide, I think uh, John and, and Jillian, are, if I'm pronouncing it right, um, did that map because I, I just wanted to, it's, it's, it's kind of a little bit dark, but it shows, you know, what in relation to where everything is on that farm, at High Park Farm. John was nice enough to put that together with his wife. You know, I really appreciate these other these other three people that helped me with this because Ralph is extremely talented with the visual end of things, and and John having the courage to go up there and interview people took a lot, I think, and, it, and he had he had a three hour drive to get there. So he's really uh, dedicated to trying to help the cause here, sort of. And I'm really happy that they were part of this and were able to be on the video. You know, my, my hope in this whole thing, I think I, I wrote to you a little bit, you know, that eventually there's going to be a disclosure of this burial site, if it, if it is the burial site. I really hope it comes from Billy before he passes or in a well or something that they'll eventually say where he is. And the reason for that, you know, like Elvis's grave at Graceland, fans can go visit it. You know, other family members could go visit it. You know, I, I just think it would be a great place to eventually have as a park. And whether that happens or not, if it doesn't, fine. But he'll do it in his time, I believe. He'll reveal what he wants to reveal. Okay, yeah, we'll have to wait and see, see what he, where he goes with it. But, yeah, no, great work, great work. John, any thoughts that, that you have? Uh, no, not really. Uh, just thanks for letting me be part of this. It's been great fun. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm, you know, you're, you're the main man. You went to the farm. <laughs> you know, yeah, that was a great day. It was a nice day. Uh, it was a uh, nice experience. Yeah, excellent. Very good. Ralph, what are your thoughts? First of all, I want to thank you for this platform. This has filled so much of my time now, and um, it's just kind of a no BS um, way of looking at this. And it's basically all facts and um, evidence that we're that, that you've actually kind of taught us how to follow this path. So very grateful for John and Gillian to for going out there and taking those pictures. It was like it was like Christmas waiting for them to post those pictures to us. <laughs> and um, even though I know everything we we know about the Beatles, I really do enjoy the music. My family loves the music. We went to see we saw Paul last year in concert. It became like a family thing. Not so much with my wife, <laughs> but with, <laughs> with my boys. They love finding clues when we're listening to music to the Beatles. It's good music. <laughs> And I do, I do love this, and I'm now loving Stanshaw, uh, his music, the the Doodah Band, and I'm just very, very happy that I came across Stephen and John and Vivian and like the, the whole group that we have going on there. It's really, really good group of people that just keep bringing us more and more information and different um, ways of looking at this, different perspectives, which which we all need. <laughs> Well, you've taken this, you guys have taken this to a whole nother level. Before, there was just a lot of guesswork about biological Paul and where he's buried and all that stuff. And, you know, here you guys have brought together a very, very solid theory. And, uh, you know, time will tell to see whether you've got this thing nailed. But again, uh, as I've mentioned to Steve many times before, you have gotten closer to the mark than anybody else that I know of. And you've done it by presenting evidence. It's circumstantial evidence. Fine. Everything with this theory, everything with just about any conspiracy is circumstantial evidence, right? 
Because if we found direct evidence, it would be case closed. So it's a matter of stitching together all of the uh, circumstantial evidence to present the picture. You guys have done a great job. What we'll do is we'll get this out. And I know folks are going to love it. The first presentation was well received, very well received. And I think between my two channels, it has like 15 or 16,000 views, which is quite good considering the, um, the topic. The McCarty conspiracy and the Beatles conspiracy is still very niche. To us, it's very important. It's very front and center. But to many other people, especially people in the conspiracy research business and the alternative research business, they don't pay a lot of attention to it. So considering, you know, our little small pie of the action, it's done very, very well. So I expect this will do just as well, if not better, than the first presentation. Well, gentlemen, that's it for today. I want to thank you very much. I'm going to try to have the presentation out as soon as I can. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me.